Thanks for staying with us. Joining us is a dual qualified solicitor licensed to practice in Nigeria, also England and Wales. She is currently the principal of Okamara Law and Consulting Abuja and also the CEO of Readmore House, a library foundation dedicated to the creation of community libraries in rural areas and the Learned Company, Nigeria's first co-working facility for lawyers and other professionals a woman of many passions mm -hmm. who is especially interested in women empowerment, development issues, and the promotion of literacies. Welcome, Undiga Umekpere. You, Umekpere. <laughs> I, I, I was singing the name, and I didn't want to bash your name because um, you do a whole lot of things. Yes. And it's, we, this is, on Wednesdays, once in a while, we'll get to bring up women we love. And the reason we do this is, we negative news thrives mm -hmm. you know sad news goes viral mm -hmm. but yet there are many phenomenal nigerians such as yourself doing amazing things so what do i even start from why do you have license to practice in two countries like what exactly what are you looking it's going for? on <laughs> Tell us. it's about having your own it's about maxing out your giftings i believe mm -hmm. that god created each person with a unique combination of abilities Mm. In capacities, things you do without even thinking that other people struggle to do. Mm. I believe that every human being was brought to this world to accomplish one thing. Mm. It might not be ground shaking, but mm. it's touch one person, do one thing. That's yeah. my core belief. So I, I'm very passionate about trying to max out all the abilities I have mm. and max out all my passions. So sometimes it looks as if my interests are Many. pointing in different directions but i just feel like sometimes i tell god like okay you gave me the ability to cook i can cook half a week mm -hmm. so what exactly Should are you I wanting me to do with it yes. you know um i love reading i love teaching what exactly am i supposed to be doing with this i love being a lawyer i like protecting people's interests i like advising what exactly am i supposed to be doing with this so Sometimes I feel it's an awful shame and a waste. Like if I was given those things, they're supposed to be used for something. Yes. Mm, and amazing. A lot of the things that we are blessed and the abilities we have are meant for other people, mm -hmm. not necessarily for ourselves. ourselves. Mm. So these are the things that drive me. If I should, mm. oh, you should be my best friend. Though, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I struggle through life yes. trying to explain to people why I can't multiple. just do one thing. Because I feel I've been given more than one. I agree. And it's not like I don't do it and I don't do it well. I do it and I do it well. But people say, ah, you it has to be one. Why don't you find out one thing? At some point, I was asking myself, are you sure I'm normal? Are you <laughs> sure they shouldn't check me? <laughs> no. But meeting people who are also like me thrive. and doing amazing, thriving, it sort of gives me joy. And there are a lot of young people out there who are a bit confused because they have so much that they can give to the world. I'm really happy about that, but I, something caught my attention, fertility law. Hmm. What is that about? Well, people ask me that a lot. Fertility law is basically that area of law that deals with the legal arrangements that need to be sorted out when a person has to, when a person tries to become a parent through assisted means. Hmm. So the traditional way is a man and woman going somewhere quiet and after nine months, yay, it's time for the naming ceremony. You know, but sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Mm. And so. you have to navigate the realities of, I try to avoid that world of infertility, mm. especially in an environment like ours, where it is really a public yeah. drama, especially the woman's cross. A woman yes. carries most of the burden mm -hmm. of being infertile. So what, do, what does a fertility lawyer do? A fertility lawyer helps to make arrangements for adoption. Mm. So it's basically an, an, an area of advanced family law, but which is not very well known in Nigeria. So one of the things I do, I advise parents, intending parents who are going down the route of surrogacy. I advise intending parents who want to use donor sperm and donor egg. And of course, I advise fertility clinics. Mm. So basically, at the end of the day, what do these people want? They want to become parents. So I advise them how to do that within the confines of the law because mm. there are a lot of people out there who prey on the desperation of people who oh, have fertility yes. issues. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I said I must come for this show, to let people know that in the midst of your desperation and your misery, don't just 
Consult a doctor, consult a lawyer, a lawyer as well. so that you don't fall prey. You can have the right documentation. Exactly. So you can have the right documentation. I mean, you, recently there was a story about the surrogates mm -hmm. and who refused to so, give up the babies. The babies yeah. And the, the other, the couple came from the U.S. and they were calling Interpol and dragging the girl and threatening her up and down. And I was looking at the story, although you never really know until you know dig deeper what the facts were, but I, I just figured to myself, if only the lawyer had advised them from the beginning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe some of the drama might have been, have been avoided. avoided. Because you mentioned it, recently I got a call from a client in Nigeria here, visiting a fertility clinic very close to my, mm. to me. And I'm aware of that clinic and the practice is always shielded in secrecy. Mm. And I said to her, if I can get your contract, I can advise you. Mm -hmm. She just blanked out. I've not heard from her mm -hmm. since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. much of what you sign into must you have at least have a copy. You know, mm. you wanted me to come in and you know, because she was already having issues. Mm. I think the donor was already giving her a problem. Mm. He had gotten a lawyer to write. Mm. And I said, can I see the contract you signed? She said, no, the mm. hospital will not release it. Mm. Mm. I'm not very vast in fertility mm. law, so maybe mm. there are areas I'm not aware of. Mm. Mm. Should she have a copy of her contract or not? She should. She should. This is part of the reason why, in fact, my partners and I are deciding that we're going to transform our, co our consulting firm into an NGO so that we can reach more people, people and be able to attract some more support and help. There's no reason why you walk into a hospital, you're paying millions of naira ah, millions of. for treatment, and somebody would say you are not entitled to a copy of your contract. It doesn't make any sense. You walk into a supermarket and you pay for goods and you're, you, get your, you get your receipt. They put and a you sign. you can get a second opinion before you go ahead. Exactly. With Exactly, exactly. But you see, when there are people are so secretive about <laughs> fertility issues. Most of my appointments are after dark. They say, look, madam, we can't come before dark. Many of my clients arrive at my office in a Bolt or an Uber. There's so much secrecy. secrecy. You're entitled to a copy of your contract. Beyond that, you're entitled to seek alternative ways to become a parent. <laughs> um, I feel... I talk about it. I volunteer for um, Quiverful Ministry. It's, uh, it helps people go through the journey of infertility, the waiting, mm. you know, provides a community, mm. help with mm. funding. Mm. Mm. And mm. I volunteer for them because I'm an only child. So I understand secondary infertility and how mm. sometimes your entire life is paused because you are waiting until you have a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the secrecy involved in surrogacy mm. and... Um, donor sperms. Can you tell us a few stories? Because I'm sure some people are watching now and wondering, I just wanted to go and buy a baby. You I know, you know. mentioned during the break that there are many illegal things people do mm. on their journey to becoming parents mm. that might later come and hunt them. Mm. So if mm. you would help us break down these illegal things and how, what's the legal structure for becoming a, a parent in Nigeria? What's accepted? Well, the truth is, when it comes to parenthood, you know, fertility, and an assisted parenthood, there is no framework yet. In Nigeria? No, there's no framework yet. Wow. But what we do, especially the best clinics in Nigeria, what they do is they adopt international best practice, particularly from the UK. Mm. Now, before anybody wants to go to a clinic for fertility treatment, they need to do a little bit of research because there are a lot of fraudsters out there. Mm. I always recommend, there's only one organization in Nigeria that represents fertility clinics. It's called AFRH, mm -hmm. Association for Reproductive Health in Nigeria. They must be members. Yes, they should be members. AFRH has a website. It doesn't take you anything. Send them an email, call them. I'm about to go to Susu and So Clinic. Are they your members? Mm. If you don't feel like calling the clinic yourself, are they your members? And they will tell you yes or mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. Because you see, what is happening is that Nigeria has some of the best fertility doctors in the world who mm -hmm. deliver world-class services at a fraction of the cost and is drawing people from abroad. People yeah. are coming from the diaspora, but because they are so quiet about it, people say, oh, medical, medical tourism, we think it's Nigeria is exporting. Mm -hmm. Nigeria also imports patients. Yeah. Mm. For real. Yeah, for, yes. for fertility. They yes. do, wow. particularly for we fertility. We should make noise about <laughs> yes. it. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But wow. people don't talk about it. How many times have you gone to church and say, praise the Lord, after 15 years of barrenness, I just gave birth, or a surrogate gave birth to my baby, or I just adopted. Nobody does that. Come that on. brings <laughs> me to my next question, which is, 
Are you planning to, uh, I, I like the fact that you mentioned you are going to look at this through the eyes of a foundation mm -hmm. so that you can help more people. Mm -hmm. But are you planning to take this message to the churches, mm -hmm. to the pastors? Because there's this thing, which I call a lie, that you must give birth like a Hebrew woman. That mm -hmm. was even a lie mm -hmm. in the scripture. There was not like an, a Hebrew woman. Mm -hmm. A Hebrew woman. The mm -hmm. women were lying so that their kids were not killed. It was just a story mm -hmm. to tell mm -hmm. you. Yeah, are you planning to move this to... The churches and religious houses who have made their people feel less than a woman if you do not give birth through the natural way? You know, that's a really important question because I didn't think, I never really thought about it, but there are some women who have died because they rejected caesarean sections yeah. because of that line yeah. from the churches. Mm -hmm. You are not a woman except you have a vaginal birth. Yeah. Then you begin to talk about what we deal with when you begin to talk about adoption mm -hmm. and surrogacy. No, and they are the devil. Do you understand? Yes. Now, when I, when I started in this practice, mm. I was in the UK. And I had the, uh, the privilege of seeing an environment where fertility is regulated and to see how it's done properly. And so when I came back to Nigeria, I was like, you know, I don't care if there's no regulatory framework. We do it the way they do it. Because I believe in this country. Change will come. Mm. If 10 years ago somebody told you that you couldn't open a bank account without an, an NIN or a BVN, you would have told the person that they were high on something <laughs> illegal. But now you can't. But now you can't. Mm. Change will come. But yeah. it might not come as quickly as we want, but it will come. So while we're waiting for change to come, we'll do things according to international best practice. Because when your client is exposed to risk, it, that risk outlives the contract. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow they'll come back and say, but Undiga, you didn't tell us that so and so and so. So I tell my clients, we draft, we negotiate for challenge. We negotiate not for today, but for the future. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. And part of my problem is I started sampling, when we started fertility law in England, we started sampling smaller communities. We had a number of focus groups. And we spoke, we invited a whole lot of people, community leaders, people who were in a position where somebody would confide in them when they were trying to go down that route. And I found out very quickly that some people told me, your view, going for donor egg, donor sperm, and going for surrogacy, and going for adoption is incompatible with my faith as a Christian. Wow. Yes, because they were like, now, don't get me wrong, I'm Catholic. I believe very strongly, I can't imagine life without God, but I believe that human knowledge was given for a reason. Yes, yeah. I agree with you. So, but you come across a lot of Christians who will tell you that what God cannot do mm. does not exist. <laughs> As if they know the how and God I chooses them, I said, to do it. What God does not do, what God cannot do does not exist. But don't you take Panadol? Mm. Don't you take chloroquine? Mm -hmm. Don't you go to the hospital? Why don't you sit down in your house and wait for God to heal you? It's a very difficult discussion to have with people because you get tangled into discussions about faith. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the churches actually will tell me, you can't come to my church. Wow. Mm. They don't want to make it an open I want to bring this back to you. So yes. people don't know, but you're an expert at civil law. You lecture, you know, contract, thoughts. Business law in Nine university years. in the UK. Yeah. And you're just sitting here oh, sending one small hey. package. I'm small. Please. <laughs> Let me do this for you. Please, let's talk more about your work. How did you foray from you know practicing into lecturing and back? Well, um I'm a lecturer's child. <laughs> I'm a I'm a cat kids grandchild. Mm. I have two grandparents who were cat kids. So teaching and learning is something that is in my bloodlines. Um, I went to the UK to study. I went to did the master's and I was just like, well, both of my parents have PhDs. My father told me when I got my first degree was like, congratulations, you're finally literate. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> this was me getting my LLB. <laughs> yes, you're finally literate. So getting an LLB was, is nothing in a family like mine. My, one of my grandparents actually retired from the Court of Appeal as a judge. So it was natural. I went on to do the master's and then went on to do the PhD. And while I was doing the PhD, people never really talk about how you survive as an international student abroad. Mm. You do all kinds of low-life jobs just to put food on the table. Now, I was in the UK with a child. My husband was a junior naval officer. He was in Nigeria. And I had to make ends meet. Mm. So I did all kinds of things. I was a cleaner. I was a carer. Mm. I took care of Old, old people, men, people in <laughs> lunatics, all kinds of things. Everything. I used to tell people, I'd do anything as long as it wasn't illegal or prostitution or armed robbery. Mm. I tried it. 
especially when you're looking for things that are flexible to fit around your Classes. studies. Mm. Mm. So while I was studying, I, I, when I got onto the PhD program, I was given the opportunity to lecture. And um, they were offering me 15 pounds per hour compared yeah. to four pounds, five pounds per hour jump. as a you cleaner. Jumped at it. <laughs> With my two legs and two hands, you just trust me. What they were doing at the Commonwealth last week is nothing compared to what I did when I got that job offer. And I found out that I enjoyed it, mm. you know, and um, I was kind of surprised to find out that I actually, people thought I was good at it. You know, sometimes you, mm. I knew I was born with above average intellectual okay. capacity. Mm -hmm. But to get to the UK and to be told that, oh, we'd like you to teach this subject. I started with one subject. I started with a contract. And then they said, oh, why don't you take thought? Oh, why don't you take business law? Mm. Oh, why don't you do e-commerce? And I was like, wow, you know, I can do this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can so really do this stuff. So why leave? And um, it was paying me much better than cleaning, care work, and all that. So, um, and I was kind of shocked. They kept me the first year, and they kept renewing my contract so for nine, nine years. years, you know. And it fit in very well with doing children and doing postgraduate uh, studies and all that. It was a fantastic experience. Great. So I want to let me bring you back to what you're doing. I, I'm, I love learning. So the truth was, I did not like learning as in family child. school as a child. <laughs> Because I did not understand, I, it felt like a chore, you know, just, let's just do this for our parents. But now, I'm enlisting to go to school and I want to really do well. I don't want to miss class, not because I want to pass, but Second I want chance. to really, really learn. Second chance education. <laughs> yeah, there, you know, and, I, and, I, and you're doing a lot in the learning space. Mm -hmm. I love your foundation, the opening of libraries, because mm -hmm. if only we had access mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. more libraries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What brought you into having libraries and, and how has the impact of your libraries been and what, what's your goal for that part of your life? Well, the libraries, the library actually, like I said, both of my parents retired as university lecturers. And, you know, lecturers back in the day, in the 80s, they were not very popular people. They were poor. They didn't <laughs> have money. You know, most of the time in your university town, if you see a car with a flat tire or broken down by the roadside, it's most likely to be a lecturer's <laughs> car. And that was me with my parents <laughs> and one old 504. In fact, I even still remember the number. BD2804. BD. <laughs> that was my father's car. <laughs> that was my father's car. And my father believed that we're all girls. My father believed that apart from getting people pregnant, there was nothing we couldn't do. So before mm. we learned how to drive, we had to learn how to check oil, check water, change spare tire. Mm. So up till now, if I have a flat tire, it doesn't even occur to me to look for somebody. I think, ah, where's my spanner? Wow. Where's my jack? Okay. I know how to do that stuff. James Bond. Yes, I learned how to open contact points and put uh, <laughs> fire <laughs> inside. Because <laughs> water was always entering my father's car. <laughs> mm. You are driving, Calabar is always Best raining. City. You drive through water, water Invention. will enter your contact points. Are you going to sit down there and wait? Mm. You have to look, come, get me matches. You open the contact points, you check it, you burn it, you dry it, you push it to one side. Wow. Then you start driving your car. And so where is the contact point? Is that the car? <laughs> I have no idea. My dear, the cars of today, but if it's 504, I can find my way around 504 with my eyes closed. 504, GL or SR, call me and you're a mechanic. I can do that one. Amazing. So what, my, nobody used to come to my house. My parents were not wealthy. But come jam season mm. or more, you see my house will be full of kids sent by their parents. Oh, Please help my child get admission. And you know, my father used to use me as a secretary. He said, look, collect all their credentials. Keep the ones that have five credits, including English, on this side. Put the ones that don't have English this side. All these ones here, like this, they are going for REMS. These are the ones that we can actually push. And I just asked my dad, I said, why is it that so many of them, they will have a C, an A in chemistry, in physics, in maths, but they can't even get a common C in English. English. And I ask him, have they not been going to school in English? Yeah. So we thought, maybe, my dad said it's from the foundation. You, English is a language, not a class subject. Mm. If you don't pass YEC English, it's a 12-year problem. You can't fix it by going for extra moral for six months. Mm. So what did we do? We said, we have this house in my village. Five rooms, God knows how much land. Who is going to live there? One of your brothers came and married me and took me to Edo State. Well, <laughs> I live in Abuja. <laughs> Who is going to live there? That was how the library was that born. That was how the library was born. So what we did was we started a pilot project in Abuja. When I used to live in the UK, we just put it on Facebook and we started getting books. Oh, please, my mother died. You know, we said we should give the books to a worthy cause. Your story course. is so strong and right. there are many layers. Like, we cannot finish it on this show. We're going to bring you back on a Thursday. Thursday.
It's not women we love. You are more than women we love. Yes. You are a lady of your view. I'm We're going to bring you, you back. Yes. We're going to gist. That is so sweet. You know, and we'll properly break it down. But thank you for inspiring us with the time you've spent mm -hmm. with us. It's amazing. We, I have to cut you, but I cannot wait to oh, have you back amazing. on the show. I would watch full show to learn all your experiences. Um, please look for Undiga online and yes. follow her. She's an inspiration. Mm -hmm. We'll take a the quick break. House. When we come back, we'll continue with the show with another segment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back.